welcome <laughs> to the panel. Uh, so I like to do a lot of polling questions uh, to start off, and I know we haven't done that yet. So if you get on your phone, you can go to bloombergenvest.app. This is the instructions. I'll be doing this a couple times throughout the program. I find that it helps uh, center the conversation. So feel free to get your phones out. We'll come at, back to that in a second. And to update you, if you haven't been on uh, your phone, is uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell just spoke. So these are the highlights I just wanted to tell you, because I think it'll come up in the conversation, uh, that basically uh, Powell will be prepared to act to sustain an expansion if the trade threatens US economy, but is wary that boosting inflation may risk market excess. So it, with the market, nonetheless, we were talking about equities rally, dollar rally, uh, yield selling, yields going higher. So that's kind of where we are right now. So polling, first question, biggest risk, your, your choices are Fed policy mistake slash inflation, uh, trade, geopolitics, and the cycle just turning slash recession. Uh, we should that, get that up in just a second. So go ahead and enter your answers, and it'll help us with the discussion here. I feel like it's like a moving target. So exciting what's going to happen. Kentucky Derby. It is. Oh, geopolitical, making the lead. Surprising. Huh. OK. I'm actually surprised about that. So uh, for the panelists here, if you guys can see, so geo geopolitics came in first, actually, at 37%, then followed by the cycle turning, then trade, then the Fed. It's like the opposite of what I talk about on TV every day. Uh, <laughs> well, what do you guys uh, make about that? Uh, Afsana, let me start with you, especially because you have such a lens into EM. What do you? What would you vote for? I would also vote for geopolitics because we're at the time, both in the U.S., in Europe, in China, in Japan, and broader emerging markets, where so much is changing politically, um, and so that will have the biggest impact. Uh, a lot of countries, are, apart from the U.S., are also going into an election period, and so much of what is getting done in the U.S. is governed by that, as well as in China with uh, with the leader there. So I think. I agree with the way this is coming out. Hmm. Bob, what about you? Uh, oh, wait, it's, an, it's a tie now. We have cycle turning recession <laughs> slash geopolitics. I was going to try and take a slant and do one that's kind of a combination rather than just do pick it. one. But I, I worry a lot about the coming decision in Europe for the next governor of the ECB. And everyone here is students of the economy and the financial markets. And 10 years ago, in the light of Lehman Brothers collapse, the worst crisis in the economy since since two world wars, Governor Trichet raised rates. And I think what Europe does not need right now is another hardline Bundesbank orthodoxy, one variable focus. And what Mario Draghi was able to do much more recently, I think it was 2012, and basically say, whatever it takes, I'm going to protect the Eurozone. That's what we need because the economy is weak. The financial institutions are still weak. And I think if we get a bad decision here, and the reason I say geopolitical, because France and Germany and people trying to mm -hmm. trade off politically who's going to be the next governor of the, of the Bundesbank, it's not worth it. We, we need someone who is, who is market friendly uh, and really understands how the markets work. Maybe I can riff off that a little bit and put Please. it together. So right now what we're seeing in the United States going into 2020, increasing focus politically on domestic even though trade's out there, but everyone's thinking, how do I jockey for 2020? In Europe, Brexit, Germany, Italy, you can go down the list. Um, and so all these economies right now, the leaders are focused internally rather than globally on a lot of issues, which means if we have a different type of geopolitical event, whether that's something in the Middle East, something in the um, Straits, something with Taiwan, something with North Korea, on and on and on, are we going to have the type of reaction function? Are we going to have the type of coordination we might need to have a global response to the shock? And add to that with the current administration here in the United States that unfortunately, it, anecdotally at least, it seems we've had a bit of a hollowing out, at least in some mid-level positions, both in the State Department, Treasury Department. So if we don't have as coordinated um, policy reactions at home, we don't have as coordinated policy reactions globally because we're all focused on internal domestic political issues. How do we react to a political, geopolitical shock? I would worry that you know, your previous speaker today, David McCormick, talked about not a lot of fuel in the tank. Mm -hmm. Not only do we not have a lot of fuel in the tank, but I don't know if we're going to have the kumbaya that we had in 2008, 2009 that helped us get through. And forget about fiscal. 
it feels like where are you going to even get that from, which, Bob, to your point, is that you don't need a hardliner leading the ECB, but then it's like you also need the countries to buy into any kind of fiscal stimulus, which does not seem to be on the table in Europe. Yeah, uh, in terms of a coordinated fiscal response. Or anything. <laughs> yeah. Or a coordinated, how do we do a TARP-like program to get the banks balance sheets clean and, and, uh, and lending to the economy again. We have a lot of challenges in Europe. Mm -hmm. So do you like Europe? Love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. where, where a crisis is creates opportunity. And, and you have to be quite careful. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be investing in large systemic banks, for example. Uh, but in Greece, in 2009, there were 25 banks. Today, there's four. It's just those 25 consolidated into the four. But that didn't solve the problem. That made 25 problems four problems, but they still have over 50% non-performing loans. We were able to acquire 100% of a, of a French bank's license that they weren't using. So we could do digital technology without legacy technology. We have not a single non-performing loan. So we can attract the people who want to build, lend, uh, uh, and uh, have the investment pay off. Very, very good opportunities, but it's not in the entrenched, it's not it's not in institutions that have legacy technology, legacy loans, legacy talent. Um, that, that won't work. So you're not buying Deutsche Bank? Is that what I'm, I'm not buying getting from Bob Diamond <laughs> right now? You can be very, very sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's pretty definitive. Um, so Afsana, that's, uh, when you look at emerging markets, then, that's focused on Europe, it feels like it's kind of different. Like there's a lot of room to run, whether it's central banks cutting, whether it's fiscal. It's like that's where the juice actually is. Emerging markets are, and we talked about this, I think, in the earlier session, uh, fastest growing, but also um, what's happening in China, regardless of everything else we're seeing, uh, in the last two, three years, they have been starting to look in much more internally and uh, building out uh, their manufacturing and their consumer goods, looking into internal markets versus external markets, mm -hmm. because I think more than anybody else, they have known that regardless of the situation we're seeing in terms of U.S.-China trade, this is really the rest of the world versus China. It's not just a U.S.-China issue. Um, and if 40, over 40% 40 of your economy is generated from trade, you know that that may not be fully sustainable in future. So they've been building that out. And you know whether the Chinese growth rate is 6.6 .6 or 6.5, and we know those numbers are fictional, or 6 or 5.5, they're still a lot higher. When we look at our growth numbers here, we look at anything from 1.5 to 2.5 in US, Europe, depending on where we're looking, or Japan. But when we look at emerging markets, if we're looking at India, obviously, it's at the upper end. If we're looking at China, it's at the upper end. We talked about um, East Asia. That's pretty high. Latin America has not really caught up as much. But what is going to be very interesting in emerging markets is that sort of wave we saw in the last 10 years of moving into ETFs will probably change, as you'll have really good companies and really not so good companies. And I think going back to Bob's point, the same point I would take and apply to emerging markets. Because they're starting with a very low base, uh, they're able to leapfrog in technology, just like mm -hmm. they did with the phones. They're doing that in education. They're doing that in health sector. They're doing that in their banking and payment systems. In Africa, they're, uh, they're banks that are more advanced than ours here because they're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. So they don't have anything to worry about. Real quick point, um, is Latin America, in your mind, different than the rest of emerging markets because of their political cycle, their risks? You know, I have been involved in Latin America since JP Morgan days, really sort of in the 80s, in the 90s, in 2000s, in the World Bank at Rock Creek now. And every time that we have a tide and a cycle, we hope that Latin America is going in a very different direction. Today we're talking about, you know, whether the pension reform in Brazil will have a big impact because it will have a $1 trillion impact over 10 years, which is sort of a large amount. But if that's the only thing you're sort of building your economy around, that may not be sufficient. So I think that despite incredible um, human capital, it, it, despite the very high level of education in Latin America, the political system, again, going back to geopolitics, not in terms of just strife, but the fact of how politics gets involved with the financial sector and the economic sector is a big problem. In Latin America, again, some of the highest trading costs today are in Brazil to just buy and sell mm. securities. That's not very conducive for, uh, for international capital to come into Brazil. Fair point. 
so Rebecca, I'll get you in just a second, but I just want to pivot off of what uh, Afsana said about China and leapfrogging. So in terms of financial services, Bob, would you be interested in those areas in China, in Asia, in, where, in India, where you kind of leapfrog traditional banking? Yeah, absolutely. Now, we focus primarily on the developed economies because we know the regulation, we know the governments, we feel that we're, we don't need outside assistance. We really know how to run banks and everything we do, we, we're very, very active. If we did something in China, which we would love to do, we would only do it with a local partner. And so in certain markets um, that are smaller uh, and more specialized, it just takes uh, a partner. But the thing about financial services that I think is so interesting right now is that regulation has dramatically impacted. But the impact of regulation is almost entirely the negative implication mm -hmm. on the SIFIs and GSIFIs. We're seeing in, in Germany today, Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank, are they too big to fail? Royal Bank of Scotland, 10 years on, is it too big to fail? No elected official ever wants to bail out a bank again. So the amount of capital and regulation on the larger interconnected banks is even greater today than any point since the crisis. But below that, regulation is incredibly supportive. The support we've had from the ECB and the support we've had from the Bank of Italy and the Bank of Greece of doing challenger banks in, in Italy and Greece has been phenomenal. We're smaller. We're not systemic. We, we, we would not create any kind of risk if, if, if something didn't go well. We're bringing technology. We're bringing digital. We're bringing access for clients. So it's a much better investment opportunity in financials than people think because they tend to think of the trials and tribulations of being too big to fail or a SIFI or a GSIFI. And the negative regulation is really focused there not below that level. Hmm. Rebecca, do you agree in your work that you've done for Europe? I, yeah, it, what both of you are saying that strikes me is that this is a good time for active management. You know, in emerging markets, obviously, if you buy an ETF, you're getting some country <laughs> exposure there that makes you cringe. Ditto if you're buying a European ETF or a European bank ETF, you're getting some exposure there you probably want to avoid. But there are things to own. We've been pretty bearish, aggressively bearish on Europe for the last at least six months, um, longer, longer now, probably more like eight or nine. Uh, but we do have some exposure. Mm -hmm. and, and because we do think there are selective opportunities, I think one of the challenges as investors is that even though you find those select opportunities, you can't ignore the global events overshadowing it, right? So Europe has greater exposure to trade than the mm -hmm. United States, relatively speaking, for example. Or if we're in a strong dollar environment, broadly speaking, even the best EM can get hit by that stronger dollar because it's going to affect sentiment towards total returns. So it's trying to find the diamonds in the rough in both of the markets, but also make sure you're understanding the broader risks that could affect your security selection and overwhelm your thesis, at least in the short run. So quickly, what do you like then? Oof. Um, well, we've been aggressively overweight the US for years now. Uh, and then Europe. But we, you can, oh, within yeah. Europe, within Europe. Um, Again, it's going to be, right now our focus is going to be on higher quality companies, mm -hmm. so companies that have larger moats, companies where their revenue, they might be domiciled in Europe, but their revenues are much more globally spread, mm -hmm. um, companies that don't have much leverage, so really safe, boring companies. Mm -hmm. The problem is everybody prefers those right now, so you're not getting those on the cheap. Right. And so usually these are positions we've had for a while, but we're not necessarily adding to them. If anything, after the European parliamentary outcome last week, um, our bias would be to actually reduce exposure mm. further. Interesting. So I want to get to the next uh, question. Um, I spend most of my time on TV talking about trade. What we don't talk about is the 2020 election, actually. So I wanted to get your guys' take on how you're looking at it. So how do you view the 2020 election? Are you concerned and you're factoring into your outlook? Or do you think it's going to be the next catalyst for the market, as in, like, that's the big kahuna? Uh, you'll pay attention, like, at some point, maybe after the primaries, you'll get into it when you see who's actually running, and then, or wait, what election? Hmm. Unless, like, one person voted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. No need to cook. It's helpful that's there, right? I didn't know that mm -hmm. the first time. Okay, so it looks like. No one's willing to vote. No, they are. Wait, what election? <laughs> nice. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, to yeah. be fair. You probably want to avoid talking about it as much as humanly possible, especially dinner tables. Um, OK, so either way, it looks like you're, people are into it. They want to pay attention, but not yet. Mm -hmm. Do you guys agree? And is that the right way to look at it from your point of view? Um, Afsana, why don't you start first in terms of then the trade and emerging market? 
lens? I might be in the minority in your second poll. I'm closer to the, it will be the next catalyst for the market, maybe, uh, and concern, factoring it into uh, the way I look at the markets. I think the reason for that is that we've, one, you know, we've been looking at what's going on with trade, what you talked about earlier, and one of the questions some people are asking today is why are there so many tweets and why is there so much um, um, attention to trade at this particular moment? Mm -hmm. Because we know that the president is one of the smartest when it comes to politics and into uh, connecting the dots uh, between economics and politics and financial markets. So why sort of the Me Mexico uh, news two days ago? Why uh, getting China from about to make Why peace? India? Why India? Maybe Australia. Uh, why, mm -hmm. again, Europe on, Europe off, you know, mm -hmm. Europe will be back on uh, uh, one day. So the question is really, is there, a, you know, we're out of the fiscal policy options. Um, the Federal Reserve is independent. They will make the decisions on interest rates. So is the causal effect here to push the news on trade to a point that might impact uh, interest rate decisions sooner than otherwise? I think there's some people who are starting to talk that way. Uh, I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, but it would be the opposite direction from what Mr. Uh, Ballard was talking about, which mm -hmm. is maybe because of what's going on in trade, we are going to reduce interest rates. Maybe we're trying to sort of push that a little bit to the front so that interest rate cuts happen more like a July and uh, September versus potentially later when that would be more natural for where we are in the economy. Which then filters through a little earlier, which sets Absolutely. you up better for 2020 if you're President Trump. Absolutely. So that has so to that, start informing Exactly. It. You said it much better. Uh, no, I just took your words. Uh, Rebecca, what do you think? Um, definitely watching it. I mean, I understand the after the primaries, because right now, especially on the Democrat side, we have so many candidates. Mm -hmm. Really, you want to have a better idea of who to focus on. But we all know it's already mattering. Uh, when you hear Medicare for all and the healthcare sector underperforms the S&P significantly for a period of time, or if <clears throat> possibly, and we don't know this, that politics might have some role to play in certain regulatory focus points. Again, I'm not saying they are, but there's a possibility, and the market certainly discusses it, it speculates that. So politics already are playing a role, driving short-term moves, at least across sectors. So I think they'll continue to matter. But again, once we get to the primary, we know who the Democrat candidate is. You can have a better sense of things. It's interesting. We're, we're working on a white paper now on politics, uh, not to try to predict anything, God help us, but <laughs> understanding <laughs> why, why as investors should we care, do we need to care? And historically, it was primarily fiscal policy and regulatory policy. And what we're seeing now, and this started really under President Obama, this isn't just President Trump, although he's taken it and run with the ball nicely, is moving policy shifts to the executive branch. Mm -hmm. So if Congress, historically, we all thought gridlock was good. Gridlock means no major policy shifts, so the markets kind of can go on other things, on earnings, on Fed, et cetera. Now we have gridlock, but we found a way to get around it. And so executive actions can be market moving. So it's a new tool in the toolkit that's being used a lot more. I think that means that politics is gonna to continue to play a role, maybe even a bigger and bigger role going forward. And we all have to get really smart on what all the executive tools there are. It feels like every day there's some new 1970s law that gets you know brushed off and refreshed. And I thought, oh, there's another one. And this okay. is a benefit to anchoring with David Weston because he's an antitrust lawyer. So he's like, oh, that reminds me of the 1974 law that came out, blah, blah, blah. I'm so spending a lot more pain. time on the USTR <laughs> website, yes. on the Department of Commerce website, making sure I understand those things. Um, so it's, I think it's going to matter more after the primaries, but it already matters now and it always matters. So Bob, is this like the election where the financials like get a break? You know, I think it's it's kind of the beauty of, of being an investor in private equity because <laughs> I was the chief executive of a very public, very large, very global bank. And so this, Brexit, these things had a huge impact day in and day out on almost everything that we did. And the macro definitely impacts what we do, but it's much more when you can take a company private and you can focus on getting the right technology in, getting the right, attracting and retaining the right talent really understanding regulation, which as I said, re regulation has been a positive in financial services. And that's, that's not out there because, of the, because you have to differentiate between the larger and then mm -hmm. below that, below the transom. So 
I think one of the one of the things I really enjoy about investing via private equity is that you can get away from some of these issues. You have to watch them; they are important. But the micro is far more important. How you're driving performance and, and putting the teams together and, and driving driving the business day in and day out. Bob, do you find any value or interest in U.S. banks? Not the big ones, but the smaller ones. Yeah. Um, so we've done a number of things here. We, we we've done a lot in insurance. And mm. the large insurance companies in the U.S. have the same issues of the large banks. The regulators want them to have more and more capital. Uh, the regulators want them to focus on doing new business. So if they have legacy risk, and we acquired a, a legacy portfolio of, of uh, variable annuities from Hartford Insurance. Uh, it was 50% of the company. And it, you know, the value of it is it released capital to Hartford. It allowed them to start doing more new business. The regulators loved it, and it took this huge portfolio of legacy assets. And the place to manage that is not in a large regulated insurance company. Get it out of there. Get it mm. in the private sector. And so we're managing it with a number of investors. And insurance companies are continually looking for ways to get rid of old risk so that they can invest in the business. Broker-dealers. We have the largest independent um, U.S. Treasury and mortgage repo business specifically because the impact on the large banks of the supplemental leverage rule and capital upon capital is reducing their balance sheets. So there's a huge opportunity for broker-dealer models rather than bank holding company. Hmm. And in terms of the regional banks, I think the U.S. is really in good shape. They're just too expensive. We love them, Fair. but it's, it's not in a position where we can see many opportunities where at these levels we can take them private and make a difference because actually it's a positive. They're quite healthy. So with about five minutes to go, let's get to sort of a contrarian view for you guys. Last polling for the audience, uh, in terms of your investment style right now, would you want to be uh, in cash? Are you looking for value? Uh, no, I forgot my choices. Looking for value, is it growth or search for yield? I think those were my five, my four, but you'll find out in five seconds. Um, there you go. There you go. No idea you want to be in cash. Defense, value, or search for yield. So go ahead, guys, and, and, and weigh in on that. And I'd like to get the panels to sit. Oh. I'm surprised, no cash. Oh, value, yeah. Okay, so value the winner with that one for sure. Um, so what I'm interested for you guys is maybe give me your uh, most contrarian call uh, or if you want to respond in a specific way to any of those options, feel free. Afsana, what about you? I'd say at Rock Creek, when we look at total asset allocation, definitely looking at uh, building portfolios that are becoming more defensive at this mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. in the cycle. When we look at specifically, let's say, emerging markets, we talked about that earlier, and looking at specific countries, specific sectors, I think definitely searching for value. So I see mm -hmm. looking at different levels of the market um, and being able to look at both of those things. So best defense, best value? Best defense, broad, uh, global, and best value in emerging markets. Where in emerging markets, though, is the best value? Emerging markets, uh, really Asia, mm -hmm. and Eastern Europe, actually, I think will be very interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Rebecca? Um, so we've also gotten more defensive this year. In late February, we actually reduced our exposure to equities modestly, but we now have a, a, a small underweight to equities for the first time in the cycle. Um, but by having the tilt to the U.S. and we have a tilt towards technology, that when things go well, um, emerging and we have some emerging markets, emerging markets do well, um, technology firms are, are kind of interesting right now because on one hand, they're getting hit on the political front, on the regulatory front, on the trade front. On the other hand, if growth is going to slow because of trade, people want organic growth, so mm -hmm. they want tech. Mm -hmm. So it's finding the right tech exposure that's not too sensitive to the trade stuff, but is going to benefit from organic growth if the economy is slowing. Um, so being defensive hasn't hurt us. Um, the search for yield, I think, is morphing. It's really interesting to me. I think you're the beneficiary mm -hmm. because the search for yield has become search for return, and mm -hmm. return increasingly means giving up liquidity. Yeah. So going private, and, and I think there's some wonderful things to be done there. I worry about the dry powder that's concentrated with some of the mega firms and what that's going to mean for returns for investors over the next 10 years as they're chasing. Um, but I think for relatively smaller private equity firms, mm -hmm. niche equity, private equity firms, people who know what they're doing and are very focused, I think that search for yield slash search for liquidity 
is um, is a good it's a good tactic, frankly. And Bob, you know, I was gonna like change it up for you, being like how much cash. But I just teed him up. You, you did. It was so good. I was gonna say I was gonna do it, but she just did it. Uh, but in terms of how, how much money is in the space, etc., and what that means. So um, I want Rebecca to know that we don't have a lot of dry power. We could use some more. So <laughs> we're, we're not one of those big ones. We're a small no. Um, Right, you so know, if you have powder, go to Bob. The, the, the financials, I'm just going to go back to financials for a second because yeah. it is big. It had a crisis. It's complex. Um, it had very, very few investors in private equity. That sector, because, mm -hmm. because I think the big banks hoovered up everything for so long, including ourselves, that there wasn't a private investing sector in financials. And yet the valuations are cheaper today than they were in 2008 and 2009. And you think of every other sector like technology and healthcare is two or three or four times as high. And it's the largest sector of the economy other than the government. So the opportunities to be investing, the problem is it's like opaque and a little bit scary. And I think the challenge we have constantly is, is how do we get our investors comfortable mm -hmm. with this? And to your other point, Rebecca, which is spot on, that there's going to be some illiquidity here. We're not, we're not going to be in and out. We're going to be in and out in five, six, seven, eight years sometimes. And our fund can extend as long as 25 years. Mm. And the regulators really like that. They don't necessarily want to see a private equity firm toward the end of a fund buy a regulated institution and have to sell it in a year or two if the LPs need their money back. So everything we do, we can extend our money as long as 25 years. And that makes us kind of um, more acceptable, if I can say that, from a mm -hmm. regulatory point of view, particularly in, in, in the highly regulated banking industry. We do have 50 seconds. So I'm going to sneak one more in. Um, we talked about the biggest risk, but I'm interested into what you guys think of the black swans. Like, what would be a black swan for you um, in your thesis making? So quickly, Afsana? I think we have uh, kind of forgotten all about the very fast trading and how that has been impacting the markets because we haven't had incidents in the last few months, as mm -hmm. far as we know, at least publicly. I think that could come back to haunt us in mm. a big way as markets switch around and start moving in different kinds of directions. It's something we haven't seen, especially sure. after the last 10 years. Good point, Bob. I would say credit, debt. I mean, the flip side, the other side of the coin of easy monetary policy, which was absolutely the right thing to do, it's been a phenomenal buildup in credit. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it coming tomorrow, but I would just leave the audience with, with kind of one picture. Since the financial crisis 10 years ago, most of the debt outstanding at that time would have matured by now. And yet there's twice as much debt outstanding today as there was when the crisis hit. Twice as much debt outstanding. So that's the, I don't know when it happens or but that's your swan. How, that's why it's a black the, swan. Yeah. Rebecca, last word to you. I'll put them. I'll put both of these together. So I don't see the debt overhang in the U.S. as causing the next recession, but I think it could be an accelerant when the sell-off begins. And my worry is just like we saw in December, and we've seen a few times now in the last few years, the amount of systematic and algorithmic trading coupled with less liquidity in the equity markets and in the debt markets means that when the real sell-off comes, not a technical sell-off, but a fundamentally driven sell-off, it's going to be really fast. So my mm -hmm. advice to people would be make sure you have your game plan now before it happens. And if you take a little profit early, that's OK. Because when this happens, you're not going to be able to move fast enough to protect your capital. That would be my fear. Great stuff. So interesting. I could talk to you guys for a while. Thank you so much.